Hello, welcome to episode 118 of the Town Hall Academy. Carm Capriato here, and we're having a very important discussion on why we need to help smart students discover a career in the automotive. You need to hear this. Now, here's a taste. Especially when you get the superintendent of the school district to really come down. That took some trying, but superintendent of the high school came down and saw what we do. And uh, there was a couple Lamborghinis on the floor that day and a bunch of stuff going on. And he kind of really kind of go, oh, boy. Welcome, automotive aftermarketers, to a Remarkable Results Radio Town Hall Academy. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Hey, Carm Capriato here, and welcome. Here's an episode to help you understand the important role you have in helping seed our career and tech education programs in high school and college. Hey, while listening, and when you're done, I suggest you create a plan of your very own to do your part in recruiting. However, and more importantly, you need to create a career path for your new hires. Hey, I want to thank Jasper Engines for their support of the Town Hall Academy. Now, you know it, Jasper Engines and Transmissions. Quality and customer service is their number one goal. Now, Jasper is an associate-owned company, and that says a lot. Their associates take pride in their work. And it shows in the quality drivetrain products they produce. Their commitment to quality and customer service has kept Jasper growing for 76 years. Find out more. JasperEngines.com. Hey, are you aware that subscribing to a podcast listening app is absolutely free? Well, of course you did. But as new aftermarket professionals discover the podcast, they're not positively sure. Yes, you can listen free, on demand, and anywhere. You know, on the podcast, we've not shied away from big issues in the industry, and the only way our investment in this great dialogue actually gets traction is if you do your part. I can relate the discussion we are having today with a thought on philanthropy. Now, hang in there with me on this. Hats off to what you do for your community. Honorable. However, the future of our industry is dependent on recruiting, training, and retaining technicians. Call it an investment in your own personal philanthropy getting involved in local education at all levels to share our high-tech industry with administration and to support the educators that are teaching young students on the automotive is a very important role you have especially as an independent now if you don't then who you'll have less to give to your community if you don't invest in your future see the show notes on the website for the key talking points and then outline what you are going to do to help the industry while helping yourself. Enjoy some great new ideas and real-world issues as I welcome Seth Thorson, shop owner of Eurotech Brighton, Minnesota, and also owner of BMW tech support company LMV Bavarian. Seth also created a $25,000 endowment for automotive careers in his community, and we also discussed that on podcast episode 340. Also with me is David Mockholtz, academic chair, automotive technology at Suffolk County College in New York. And Aaron Dalton, Coordinator School to Career Programming at the North Kansas City Schools. Hey, we need your support. Get involved. This is a topic that, please don't ignore it. Please don't say that it'll take care of itself. We really need to do something about it. Dave, I want to go to you first with a question. Are we selling ourselves short that the automotive is a fantastic career? I think to some extent, uh, you know, I think a lot of our students sort of the stopping point is whoever it is that they're working with that they, you know, repair shop or dealership. Uh, and I guess kind of what I was after was that selling ourselves short pieces, you know, we have to be careful who we're putting students with, uh, you know, when they're out at a work site uh, or when we hire a student in and they come in and they're going to, you know, they're going to work with a master tech or they're going to work with a B tech. They have to be with the right person because, that person is going to ultimately sell your business uh, and also our business to that student. And if that experience isn't stellar, uh, the student starts to wonder and they come back and they talk to their friends. You know, we see it here at the college all the time. Uh, it's sort of like buying a, buying a car or going someplace for service and you have a bad experience. If the experience is a bad one, right, what's that customer going to do? They're going to go and they're going to tell everybody they know. And, you know, usually the bad thing more so than the good thing, right? Uh, so we have to be careful, I think, as an industry of making sure that when we're bringing students in uh, and getting, you know, new people, uh, you know, into our businesses that we're not selling ourselves short, that our, ultimately our culture is right within our business, 
uh, and, you know, from my perspective, making sure that students are in the right fit, you know, at a work site. How do we get this, uh, this to be, and I'm going to use a crazy word here, and, and just don't jump on me when I say this. How do we convince the, the, the public, the parents, the kids that this is a pretty sexy, high-tech job today? Seth, any idea? Some of it starts at, I mean, high school. Um, I, you know, I mean, we talked about the scholarship that entices kids to even go there, but we have to start at the high school level. And so my latest initiative and, and we've accomplished that at one local high school is we have a career path to trades now. So now the guidance counselors will actually present a class schedule as they become juniors and seniors to go into the trades along with um, proposed incomes and things like that. And we're actually reaching out to high school students. We have a trade council now at our local high school. Um, and that's just one school, I understand that. But it's something that shops can replicate if they want to get involved with even the high school students. Aaron, how much are you seeing that the independent automotive aftermarket, even the dealerships, are getting involved with the middle school, uh, the voice at the middle school? So middle school... Really, we don't in our district, and I'm speaking for just our district and, and our experience here. Uh, we have just started working more with the middle school students, uh, primarily eighth grade. Um, we had a big transition in our district to where we currently have four high schools. We have four middle schools and two sixth grade centers and then many elementary schools. So we're starting that transition to give them that information starting in eighth grade to then Think about that four-year pathway to possibly be uh, starting their junior year into the automotive program. So just this past year, we had uh, different career fairs that we sold to the eighth graders at uh, each middle school. We went to the middle schools and we brought in the automotive teacher and students this time. And then next year, our goal is to start bringing in those companies to talk with the students as well. So this year was kind of a test pilot. Um, in the past, we've just had one large uh, career fair where we brought in all four middle schools and a ton of uh, business partners, but it was too large and too much for the, and too fast for the students to really grasp what they wanted. And so we wanted to have more time for them was basically to talk. Aaron, who was there? I, I'm trying to dig down. Did you see independent shops? Did you see people from automotive career? Career fairs could be for all different kinds of careers. Sure. Uh, we, we saw um some more larger companies. We did have some of our smaller companies come in, our business partners that are primarily with our automotive teacher, because that's how we usually go to is we go to our automotive teacher and ask, okay, who do you want to be there? Who do you want to help support? Because those that are supportive of the program, we want to have them come in and talk with the students too. Um, but our uh, business partners are growing every year. We're getting more and more uh, involved because they see the relevance of the high school students starting this pathway, which then leads into the college, our local community college automotive programs or for your institute. So it's, it's definitely changing and it's growing, not as fast as we would like, but it is changing. Do you see the investment, David, at Suffolk staying up to speed so that, you know, you've got your, you're teaching the right stuff with the right equipment? You know, it's always a challenge to get funding. I mean, our, our success at Suffolk, at Suffolk is really hinged on uh, manufacturer partnerships. Uh, we're up now to seven direct manufacturer partnerships at Suffolk. Uh, so, you know, granted, that's a bit more dealer based. However, those those programs also uh, attract students that, you know, say, you know what, I think I might rather work in an independent repair facility. Uh, so our resources have been pretty abundant in that regard. Also, things like grants, um, you know, different funding streams, creative funding streams in many instances. Uh, it's definitely a challenge, but, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, willing and able partners out there that are willing to come in and work with with the right programs that are, that are doing the right things. And ultimately, that's tied to outcomes. You know, you're not going to get, uh, you know, support from manufacturers or, you know, tool companies or whatnot if the structure and the integrity and the quality of your program isn't there. So for us, quality has been paramount, you know, more so than quantity in terms of students coming out. It's, it's really been a quality game for us. And, and really that's, that's the key in engaging, you know, all your partners is to make sure that at the back end, the student that's coming out is, is selling your program for you. Make no mistake. 
uh, I'm a, I broadcast to the independent uh, automotive aftermarket. Um, and you had said that you've got some manufacturer programs out there. Of course, that, that connotates the dealer network for me. And, and, and even at Erie Community College here, I'm part of the State University of New York system, and I'm on the advisory panel, and there's uh, 85% you know, manufacturer based on the advisory panel. You had said something just a few minutes ago that says it ain't bad to come out and work for an independent. What did you mean by that? And how could you t- stitch that together for me? What are they saying? Why would they want to go to an independent? Well, I got to go to dealer. Big brand name is going to be great. Maybe long career, lots of benefits. And we're finding that there's a 50% churn. Sure. I think a lot of, uh, you know, students that come out of programs that wind up in dealerships initially, uh, it depends. It's highly dependent on the location, but in many instances, they wind up and they wind up working in the maintenance area, right? So they're doing oil changes. So they get disenchanted pretty quickly if they stay in that area for too long. So the benefit and allure to an independent shop, you know, a, a shop like Cess, I haven't personally been there, but I hear wonderful things. Um, you know, to go in and work with someone that's passionate about the brand, uh, passionate about the particular, you know, uh, type of vehicles that they're working on, uh, and the ability to, you know, work on other jobs and in other roles other than just loop tech, uh, is a key in, in really selling the program. So a lot of our independent partners, they're, they're having students do a lot more, uh, variety of work. Uh, than they would be doing if they started off day one at a, you know, let's say a BMW dealership or something of that nature. A vehicle is more than just transportation. It's what we depend on to move our most precious cargo, our families. As a service professional, you provide routine maintenance for your customer's vehicle, but what do you do if the engine, transmission, or differential fails? Contact Jasper, of course. Jasper provides your customers with a cost-effective alternative to purchasing a different vehicle. Quality, remanufactured products from Jasper Engines and Transmissions carry a nationwide warranty with up to three years, 100,000 miles, parts and labor coverage. Get your customers back on the road fast as Jasper offers immediate availability through two distribution centers and a network of 45 branch locations nationwide. If a new vehicle is not in your customer's budget and the engine or transmission in their car, truck, van, or SUV has given its last performance, a remanufactured drivetrain component from Jasper Engines and Transmissions will provide them with many years of trouble-free driving at a cost many times less than that of a new vehicle. For customer satisfaction, choose Jasper. You know, Seth, I think the crime here is that we know that we've got to get on our soapbox and get out to middle school. Aaron, you were so poignant in saying it's got to be eighth grade. Well, at least we have a number. We have an entry gate, eighth grade, okay? And we've got to get to the parents. We also need to get to the counselors. We need to get to the to the superintendents and the principals. And let's please talk about that because something very interesting came up yesterday on that panel that I'd love to ask you guys. But, but Seth, being involved, uh, and, you know, here it is. We're we're going to go out and say the message, high tech, 100 million lines of code, really a great business to be in if you want to be in high tech, the computer on wheels. And then we put them in a maintenance job for how long, right, David? You just mentioned that. Long time. So, but, but everybody's got to pay their dues. And as I think the industry has discovered, and I think we have to do more as key industry members to create the career path. So if someone's going to come into maintenance, they know it's how long it's going to be, and they're going to be shuttled, if you will, or mentored through the chairs. But if you come in and you say, I, I'm gonna, yeah, I thought it was going to be great, but I think I'm in, I think I'm in a dead end job because no one's ever outlined it. Do you see that going on in your neck of the woods? Yeah, we do, we we see some stuff for sure. Uh, one of the things we that we did real well is we worked with our local community college, and actually they do a shop tour. They're graduating seniors of the independent, and that they brought them to my independent shop, and that opened their eyes like you wouldn't believe. I had six or seven kids wanting a job immediately after that tour. Obviously, I hired one of them for my new store. Um, I always have an apprentice at some point in our in our staff, but they they got the tour to independent. They got to dispel some myths of what they thought the independent was. They got to see factory tools. They got to see a very high tech facility, an air conditioned shop, white floors. They got to see a really high end facility that all of a sudden encouraged them that okay, there are alternatives in the dealership. 
and that made a huge difference in in their perspective and whether they came to work for me or went and applied at five or six other independents. I talked to the kids after, you know, as they're milling around the shop and looking around and some of them said, hey, I'm going to apply at this other independent. And I'm like, great, you know, kind of give them some options of, of what's out there. Um, as far as what we lay out for our apprentices when we hire them, we have a two year plan laid out with every pay bump, which is big to millennials, what they will make if they hit every goal every six months to a year, they get a pay bump every six months, all the way to a two year gradu- graduation program of that. I love that. I mean, you're talking about a graduation program inside of your business? Yes. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's a great idea. So hey, listen, you're coming You're coming out of a two year post-secondary and we're gonna put you through our own two year program. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And does it require ASE? Does it require, um, you know, a, a, a the mentor or apprentice kind of assessments? Uh, uh, give me, a, give it, give us an idea. So, I mean, when they first start out, we have them do some real basic stuff, and then as they work towards their ASCs, ASCs are one part of moving up. So the idea is the average student takes about two years. Now we have one student that had no automotive experience, so he went to tech school. He's probably on a three-year plan because he's missing some goals, but he's fully aware where he's at and he's loving it. Um, he just did a cylinder head on Audi. He loves it. Um, but our, some of our other guys have made it in two years and it's just, you show core competency in certain areas and then we move you up and we, we graduate you to, you know, a full service tech after about two years. Got it. Thanks for that guys. Aaron messaging. I, I mean, I, I think one of your big jobs out there it, it, getting to the eighth grade students, uh, is messaging. But my my key is, is do we have to change the parents and, and the school system, too, to, to recognize what we're doing up here? We we do. Um, when students still think about automotive as a dirty shop and I'm going to get my hands dirty. And what our instructor has already done is automotive is very high tech now. So we're beginning to make sure our equipment uh, is up to date. We just purchased a new twenty thousand dollar printer because. Uh, putting prints on cars, that's a big industry right now. So we're, we're bringing them different ideas towards automotive. So now we're working with our graphics department to help us send students to the automotive program to work on graphics because that's just not um, everywhere else on billboards. It's also on vehicles and you see graphics on cars everywhere. So we wanted to grow that um, and then working more with the latest computer technology too to show students that, okay, maybe you're a programmer where do you want to work with an automotive too? So it's just not getting your hands dirty. Yes, we still have those classes and it's they're fantastic, but students aren't understanding at an early age uh, what it's all about. Have you ever been asked to go out and speak to uh, any middle school career day? And and I know that you, maybe you can't just talk about automotive, but when you do talk about automotive, what do you say? Usually with those career days, I have um, the automotive teacher come and talk, but we, what we found with, uh, talking with students is having other students talk to them. They can listen to us all day long, but in the end, we're, we're teachers, we're principals and, or we're parents and they're, it, they're just not going to look at it the same, but, um, students have more of an effect. So today, um, just before I came on, we had brought students in to talk with the other students and tell them their experiences that they've had in these programs. And that sells it a lot better. We've seen our enrollment increase more of, from the students talking to the other students than from us. So that's been our biggest impact so far. I, I always wonder if if the real world that exists out there really knows and understands that we're a $381 billion industry, 2.4% of GDP, 4.6 million professionals in a variety of careers work in it. We represent 3.2% of the total U.S. non-farm employment. There's 300,000 jobs available at any time and on and on. Average age of a vehicle is 11.7 years. Lots of opportunity uh, to earn money fixing today's transportation needs. And yet, it's a dirty blue-collar job. And on the panel yesterday, one of the, uh, I, th- I think it was Roxanne Griffith from Department of Labor, she said, you know what, construction's no longer a dirty blue collar job. And she, she, she went out to point about, you know, that the construction with all the tools and equipment, all the technology that's being added to the labor force, it is not as filthy and dirty as it is. And she was, uh, someone also mentioned that it's cheaper to put a CAD CAM class 
um, or an IT class room or CTE program or CET program together than fund automotive. And Seth, you put the $25,000 endowment together. Somebody at that level must so much believe in you to take that. And so they're, they probably are so committed to automotive because of the things you're doing. Did, according to instructors at the college, raise some eyebrows for, for some of the uh, deans and, and higher up, which is how those colleges work. And, and, of course, then not to be outdone, one of the bigger dealership groups created their own endowment. So now there's more money for kids to go. It's great. How cool is that? Well, thanks for starting off the pendulum swinging. David, do you feel that there's going to be a huge pendulum shift in the fact that uh, people are going to start coming into the automotive once we get our act together and we start helping the recruitment effort? We, the industry, starts helping the recruitment effort? Yeah. And, you know, I think right now is it's kind of a unique moment in time for us as an industry. Uh, every single phase, as you said, of the automotive industry and ancillary industries, for that matter, uh, are in a severe uh, shortage. Uh, they need people. So the time for them to be creative is now, uh, which I think is, you know, like Seth mentioned, you know, the the idea of an endowed scholarship. Uh, we're seeing, you know, programs that are offering tuition reimbursement, tool incentives, uh, so I, I think it's going to be a very good time to get into this industry uh, starting now uh, within the next five to 10 years. I mean, especially with the ramp up of technology, it's not getting easier to fix a car. Maybe in some regards it is, but uh, the, the amount of information and technology that's on a vehicle uh, would be attractive to the right person, but it has to be tied to compensation. Uh, it has to be tied to, uh, you know, the other ancillary pieces that would make this an attractive field. It's not, and it's not just compensation, but there are other pieces to that as well. Uh, going and working in a shop like Cess, that's a spotless shop. Um, that's a huge draw to somebody that wants to work on high tech, you know, European vehicles. And, uh, you know, the more Cess that we have in the world and the more manufacturers that we have in the world that step up and do the right thing. Yeah, this is going to be a great time to get into this industry. So anyone who's on Facebook and anyone who's on the Zoom webinar platform, I'm going to ask you to uh, tell us something. Who's on advisory panels, both at high school or post-secondary? Just, uh, yeah, me too, by the way. And, and so it, we're, we're all qualified somehow here. But, but uh, you know, from the panel, please get in there and say, I am, I am. And, and the, the point is, there's no doubt that Either we are doing our job or we're not doing our job by getting involved in education. It's it's one thing to get good apprentice, grow your own, uh, build a learning culture inside your business, but you just can't do it without getting involved. And Seth, I mean, you, you you're the best person here for a testimonial on that. Yeah, I mean, we we get involved with whatever we can. I mean, get the students to do tours. Um, I volunteer, and and we just we're going to our NASTAF review, which if. Some of you guys know what that is. That's a lot of fun um, with the local college. We try to, you know, we get them out. We do we do mock interviews with a lot of the students. I volunteer to get in and do mock interviews with the students because they have no idea what's going to happen when they go out to interview. And that's always been a good thing. And, frankly, I found some really good kids just doing the mock interviews. But it's always been really helpful to the students and, and instructors like it. Um, there's just so many needs they have. Um, there's times that we upgrade equipment, and our equipment – for me, at least, when we upgrade equipment, we still have great equipment. A lot of times the colleges need that equipment. Um, I have customers that get rid of very high-tech vehicles for an expensive problem, and there's times I can get my customers to donate the vehicle to the high school or to the college, and, and they have a vehicle they can use for training. There's just so many ways you can do very little things without even outlaying much money. So uh, one of the things that came up in yesterday's discussion, and it was so apropos, and I don't, I don't mean to, to pull on what we did yesterday, but... I just have to because it's fresh on top of my mind. And and one of the things that I actually got up during the panel and I put in my three cents and I said, you got to follow the where the you got to follow, follow the money. And here's what I mean by that. A couple of discoveries that I had and actually the Department of Labor even confirmed it is that some of the counselors, they've got requirements and incentives to make sure that they're 100 percent college bound with their group of kids. I, we also we were told by the Department of Labor that the Department of Defense has incentives to help recruit for the Army, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marines. Interesting, right? Very interesting. And and there's still that stig stigma that's going on inside. Well, 
um, send Johnny to the, you know, to Votech. And, and some of the kids that are being asked to go to college want to go to Votech. How do we stop? How do we stop that at the educator level? Aaron, you would maybe be the best person here. Actually, you and David. Uh, how do we get that message out? We can join, we can join the advisory panels, but we have to get in deeper. School boards, print, do we, do we, do we literally, you know, we're, we're the premier shop in the neighborhood. We know it. We feel it. We are. Should we be going to sit down with a, with a counselor, a principal, or a superintendent? Um, I'll go ahead and talk on that. We have seen, um, that's been our biggest hiccup with our system and how we're enrolling students is we give so many options for students to take different classes throughout our high schools that it's kind of overwhelming. And so our counselors are spread many different directions. They're supposed to tell students to go this route or this route or take this class, go talk with this person, visit this school. Uh, And it's so much that they get overwhelmed with um, meeting those requirements of students needing to be in these programs or helping us out. And so we're trying to find easier and better ways using social media, for example, or um, things like this, doing podcasts to inform the parents and students so that we can reach them outside of just our counselors and principals, because they are so used to having things handed to them. Hey, take this class or do this or other teachers recruiting for their program or their after school activities that it just gets so much. So we're trying to find more creative ways to reach students that we can if we can get to them often and they can hear that message often. Hopefully our numbers will recruit increase. Now, we just started that this year, so we, we don't have the data to back that up yet to see if it's working. But from our uh, just talking with students, parents, uh, they're hearing it. And so we know something's getting out there, but we haven't seen the increase in enrollment yet. David, your perspective on that? Yeah, I I think one thing that's worked really well for us is actually bringing the counselors here. Uh, You know, we I go out and do plenty of talks. You know, at different schools, and counselors are there, and they hear it. But seeing is believing. I think. Uh, You know, for example, uh, recently we had a car set up to do uh, some some ADAS training. And uh, targets were set up in the room and a couple of counselors came through and they said, what are you guys doing? So when they saw the, the complexity and technicality of, of just one aspect of the, the jobs that, you know, we're training technicians to do, uh, it's, you know, that's a huge takeaway for them. So they go back and they go, all right, this is not what we thought it was, which is what you want them to think it is. I think the the challenge also is when they go, all right, well, what's the rate of pay for a, for a student that's, uh, you know, out in a dealership or, uh, you know, and, and that always becomes the complicated question because rate, rates of pay are all over the place. Uh, so th- that I think, you know, bring them in, show them what it is. And then the challenge is on the back end, making sure that, uh, you know, independent repair shops, franchise stores, dealerships, like Seth, uh, like go to a model like that, you know, where you have a, a scaled pay plan, you have incentive based pay, you have uh, milestones for for these, uh, you know, apprentice technicians to hit and and that they're being mentored. You know, it doesn't all again come down to compensation, but students want to see a pathway from point A to point B. Uh, and if, if, you know, counselors see that that's in place, they, they're going to have a lot better feeling about going, hey, Johnny, go into the automotive industry, because if you do X, Y, and Z, it's going to equate to this in terms of what your salary is going to be. We, Yeah, we, we brought some of the high school um, principals and guidance counselors, and we've actually um, got some of them to tour our shop. And that kind of opens their eyes when they see the work that these guys and gals and kids and adults are doing especially when you get the superintendent of the school district to really come down. That took some trying, but superintendent of the high school came down and saw what we do. And uh, there was a couple of Lamborghinis on the floor that day and a bunch of stuff going on. And he kind of really kind of go, Oh boy. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I, it's, it's seeing is believing for sure. What, what a great thing. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, you, you brought up something huge, David, and that is, you know, so, so what can they earn? So I'm going to ask you that question live, right? Yeah. I, 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 you're, you're giving me the tour. You're showing them all this high tech stuff, all the targets, all the ADS calibration going on. So what can they earn? How would you answer that? Well, <laughs> that, that's a, it's a loaded question, really, right? Because uh, you, you think of it, and you know, I can think of some examples of students that um, 
you know, we've tried to recruit, believe it or not, to come back and uh, say, hey, you know, you might want to think about, you know, putting your, your hat into the ring for a teaching position somewhere down the road. And they say, wow, you know, I really, I can't take the pay cut to come back and teach. And um, you go, okay, so clearly this person must be doing pretty well. And you get into some of what the salaries are and they're, they're substantial. You know, some of them are, you know, in our in our market, we're in the New York market, so we have a high cost of living. Pay, pay wages tend to be a little bit higher uh, than the national average. But we have quite a few technicians that are out there making a six-figure salary. Um, however, the norm is, and this is the challenge, when a student starts as an apprentice, I would say that the average right now for us on Long Island is is around minimum wage or better. Uh, so it's 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 a tough pill for a student to swallow uh, to say, all right, well, I'm going to make the same amount of money as it, as I would make at Aldi's grocery store down the road uh, to work on a hundred thousand dollar car uh, to buy my own tools and to not have an end in sight for getting out of that pay range, you know, especially if they're on a loop rack, you know, or, or you know, not in a situation, you know, such as Seth presented where, you know, they're working with a mentor and there's incentive based pay. So that's the challenge is the range, right? Uh, getting them beyond that feeling of, gosh, I'm making 13, 14, $15 an hour. How do I support myself? How do I support, you know, living on my own, having a family? buying a house. Um, how do I, how do I make a livable wage? And that's, that's the challenge is that the learning curve initially, I think in our industry uh, is probably five to seven years to get to the point where you're probably making a pretty solid salary. Uh, and when I say that, that's a generalization, you know, I would say that's more the norm than, uh, than the exception. You know, I think the exception right now is, is a shop like Cess and we have to get from an exception uh, to the norm. All right, make make sense, you know, scenario the norm. And I think that's that's what we're up against as an industry is making that a reality. Yeah, I mean tool, tools are tools are a huge cost to these techs and, and I I uh, beat shop owners over the head on some of our shop owner forms about, and I get grief every day about it, but I continue to beat on them. Um, our apprentices, when they're hired in, we tell them don't bring tools. We supply a basic toolbox. And we tell them to buy as you need. And we have some tool incentive programs to help them purchase their tools. But um, if they have some tools, great, they can bring them. But we generally tell them that we'll supply everything you need as you start and as you grow. Now, it comes with like some rules. Obviously, we inventory our tools every night. And if you guys stay an hour and a half to find that 10 millimeter socket you lost, then I'll sit there for an hour and a half and you'll find the socket. You know, sure. I mean, it's, it's teaching them to be respectful. And it helps them later when they own their tools. But... Yeah, I mean, uh, the wages need to get fixed. I, you know, the analogy I use is my brother went to school to be an engineer. All my brothers went to school to be engineers. I went to school to be a technician. And uh, they get paid way above what they're worth coming out of school because they aren't worth what they're getting paid coming out of a four-year school. It's just not the case. They're sp smart, brilliant people. They're my brothers. I love them. But they're not worth what they're getting paid out of school. Same thing with any field, right? We, we have to pay these kids more. We have to pay them what's commensurate with what's going to happen going forward, not what they're worth that minute they walk in. Pay them based on the expectations you have for them and the, and the plans that you create. You, you know, I, I sat through a uh, just a very... A uh, small amount of a class yesterday, uh, being taught by Bob Cooper and Darren Barney from Elite Worldwide, and it was, and they presented this incredible spreadsheet on technician pay, based on ASC certifications, based on tenure, and based on efficiency. It was really incredible, and and they they, they believe that every technician inside the company should be should they all know this is it. And, and the better you are, and the the longer you've been out of school, and if you've gone to school, there's there's the pay program. And look at look at what and, and the and the top end was huge, and the bottom end wasn't no minimum wage. It was a, it was a res respectable place to start. And and as soon as you started to be more efficient, and as soon as you started to get your ASEs, your pay went up. It's a whole career pathing idea. Seth and I are going to come back, I think, in a few weeks uh, and do a town hall academy titled "How Can We Pay Our Technicians a Hundred Thousand Dollars a Year?" Am I right? Yep, and and we've got it, and I think that's a dialogue that we need to have. I I know that people are going to come and uh, gonna hang out and listen to that and say, "How the hell do you do that?" Well, guess what? It's one of the most important things we can do. Will the hundred thousand be you know the high end, the top end? Will it be twenty percent of the industry? Yes. 
but that middle group doesn't need to be thirty thousand dollars. It it needs to be you know fifty to eighty thousand dollars. I think the opportunity in our industry is so big, but our leadership team, our owners, need to step to the plate and re-engineer themselves and their businesses. And and, and many have, but not enough have because David, Aaron, you're probably fighting that. Um, that stereotypical, you know, it's, well, it's just a grease monkey job. It's a blue collar, ugly thing, and they don't make a lot of money. And you try to tell them what the exception is, but we've got to figure out what the rule is. And we need to help you by running better businesses and coming up with some really great career pathing and pay programs. And I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> and, I, and I'm off it. I'm off it. So how do we go out and get the messaging right guys that we're a high tech we're in a high tech business what can we talk about what can we show yeah you can do the shop tours and everything but when we're asked to go out what do we need to bring with us to show people what we're doing a presentation a video equipment tools what do we got to do i think for uh high school and middle school they they want to touch things they want to see things they want to maybe have some type of project that they can put together um they're hands-on because the students that want to be in these programs are hands-on students. So that's going to be something to attract them with. Um, in our districts too, we're also working on those non-traditional students to be in the program. So in increasing uh, that, so finding ways to make it um, acceptance for everybody in different ways so they can be attracted to the automotive programs and, and all the programs we promote. Uh, we're also looking not along with your question, we're trying, we don't have direct feeder classes from our middle schools for our ninth grade, our sophomore year, our programs start junior year. So we have nothing for them besides just talking with them. So we need classes as well to feed into those automotive programs so students can stay with it early and continue on. I think that would increase our numbers and have the students more involved with it too. If you had five or six independent shop owners at your beck and call wanting to work with you, you know, just on call whenever you need them, your go-to how, how are you going to find them? How do we find them? Well, uh, what I previously said before is we have our instructor, our automotive instructor. He's fantastic. His he's involved with our community college too. He teaches there, and so he's able to tap into the resources of the community college as well as our local areas. I mean, we have uh, around our schools, we have many uh, companies. A lot of those are large companies. To tell you the truth, um, I, I think we do need to increase our, our individual shops, like you were mentioning to uh, be within the schools, but we would, we're always accepting uh, more people. If they could be there, we'll take them. We'll foot them in. I, I have to tell you something. I think our independent group and Seth confirm or deny this. We're missing such an opportunity. Uh, the kids are being siphoned off into, into, in the dealerships. Listen, I got a lot of friends in the, de you know, I, everybody's on my panel. You know, like I said, 80% of them are dealership guys. They're great guys. They're hard work and they care about our industry. But I think they're making a few missteps, and but but we're finding out that the uh, that the groups that's uh, that's, if you will, fading out after a couple of years are not joining the independents, and they're going to other careers. You know, they've got a toolbox, they've got some basic mechanical skills. You know, two years in, it's it's Department of Transportation's, it's it's diesel, it's forklift, it's it's boating. They're they're going. They want to work with their hands. A lot of the a lot of the programs are better there. And, and I guess my plea here continues to be, and it's been a theme of the show for so many guys, even like the set that have come on, get involved. You, you've got to be involved. So if you're involved at the community college and they're finding out that someone may be leaving, you know, you know we've got to, someone's got to put their hand up and said, send everyone who got disenfranchised to me. And I, I think some of it, some of it is I don't, the independents need to get involved. Some of it is I don't, they know how. So some of it falls on, and I'll plead plead to Dave and Aaron that call some of the bigger independents that are nicer. Go visit them. Go talk to them. Tell them, hey, this is how you can get involved. Can we come to a shop tour? They Some of these guys are really busy at some of these independent shops, and they don't know what to do. It's not that they don't, but, you know, I know they should reach out, but sometimes you guys should reach out to them and say, hey, what can we do? Because too many guys end up at the dealer. They do churn out. They don't come to us. Um, and... Uh, a lot of the programs are heavily sending guys to the dealer and, and that's because the dealer does a much better job of recruiting through the colleges. They show up at every event. They're on every trade board sheet. They they're there and they're recruiting and they do a better job of it. So consequently that's where the students end up. That's where the students come back and talk to. That's what the instructors push students to. Um, it, it is a hard transition to get these guys to look outside of that. 
Um, and that's been a struggle for a while. Um, but I think sometimes the colleges need to reach out to the other shop owners. And I know that takes some work on your part too. Yeah. I'll, I'll just weigh in on that a little bit too. Yeah. I, occasionally I think we're all too much in our own silos. Uh, you know, we get tied up in a day to day of what we have to do. And a, a lot of times I, I just have to jump in the car and I, I have to go and stop in and see different shops and, and, uh, I think the challenge in our market is in the New York metropolitan area, there are over 3,000 registered repair shops. My program has 207 students. So the, cha- the challenge for me is, okay, how do I, how do I keep the phones quiet uh, with the amount of shops that call on a daily basis? And, and I, I, I say that kind of facetiously because we, we need you know, the need for our students to go out and work. But at the same time, the the demand is so great, I could quadruple our program and still not make a dent. Uh, so that I think is a part of the challenge with the colleges too, is that, uh, you know, in terms of, especially community colleges, we're lightly staffed, you know, we're, uh, you know, not human resource rich. Uh, so I, I think that's a challenge for us as well is, is, is we're, we a lot of times are in a, a triage mode you know we're trying to put fires out for who's calling and um and yeah a lot of times it the low-lying fruit becomes the dealer shops because quite frankly you know the students it's in their face so you know i've got a fleet of 100 cars from you know uh you know seven different manufacturers most of them are five years old uh or newer uh, so I'm getting 2019 vehicles already. So the students are seeing those cars. They go, wow, I think I might like to go work for Chevy. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the, the struggle, you know, for the independent shops is real. Uh, we can do a better job clearly as a college. Um, but, uh, you know, collectively, I think, you know, as an industry, we, you know, we just need to be involved and, and do as much as we can. And uh, I think the challenge for everyone is time, right? Time is our, you know, most valuable resource. Uh, but, you know, channeling our time and using our time as best we can. Uh, I've always had a passion for the aftermarket. And I grew up in independent repair shops and I, I love to see students get into the right shop as well. So, yeah, it's just a matter of collectively staying out of our silos and, and being involved and and person like me visiting your business, but you visiting the community college as well. It's a two way street. Oh, I agree. Yeah, sometimes even if you set up a tour of a high-end independent, if you find one high-end independent and tell them there are shops like this out there, that sometimes is just all it takes to give them a little opening. Yeah, yeah, we've had some fantastic independent shops we work with, and uh, you know, we've continue to work with. We do a career fair every year, so you know, typically uh, that's another way for us to have a single point of saying, hey, you know, we're open to everyone. You know, it's not just dealerships it's not just chain stores it's not just independence we want to show students you know the the large array of opportunities that are available to them uh in in, in a sense it's a bit of a challenge uh because now you you, re, you really open the door to okay this skill set is transferable right as car mentioned you know forklifts you know we had crown forklifts here uh visiting uh, a couple weeks back and uh 2150 an hour is the starting uh, wage for a forklift mechanic uh, for Crown here on Long Island. So you walk out of trade school and into a twenty-one fifty an hour job that is not flat rate, that pays uh, time and a half if you go over forty hours, double time on the on like a Sunday, for example, or on call. So that's you know that's the the other part of the equation is, you know, the, the students that we're training have a very highly transferable skill set. So we constantly have to be in the mode of, you know, as the automotive industry of encouraging, and this is part of my role is encouraging our partners to be uh, aware of that and also to be really uh, cognizant of the fact that, you know, their competition is not necessarily the shop down the street or the dealership down the street. Their competition is broad. It's a lot broader than, than a lot of times we would want to admit. Our uh, techs are getting poached by other industries, especially if we can't show them uh, a career path. And Seth, that it's, it's more than ne- not always the money. And, and you know, this it's the culture, it's the commitment to training. It's, you know, having the right tools. It's uh, it's time off. It's recognition. It's all of that. And, and to me, that's such a big, big part of the change that's necessary in our industry. The top performers, they get it. 
but it's the it's the ones in the middle that that we really need them to step to the plate and help because uh, again i i always think that you know is there going to be another 10 or 20 years where if you're not at that level you're you're going to be out uh, i don't know i i just can't quite confirm it what do you think of that well, the industry needs to take care of themselves, too. I'm going to go back to Dave's, one of Dave's opening comments about pairing the technician with the wrong mentor. Um, we have an opening in one of our companies, and we interviewed a guy, and we talked about one of our core beliefs and core competency and core culture beliefs is we are a training facility. We believe in training techs. And the the one guy we're interviewing said, well, as long as he doesn't get in my way, well, there you go, strike three, you're out you're not getting the job. He, he's a very talented tech. Don't get me wrong. He could do real well in my company, but he's not going to fit into the culture. And he firmly said, get it. If that tech gets in my way, I don't want him there. Well, then you don't fit our company. Um, and so eventually as an industry, if we want to push forward with what we need with true apprenticeships and things like that, then, you know, we have to look at who do we want in this industry still? And what do we have to do to push some of those people out or make them change their beliefs? A, a final comment, and, and maybe Aaron and, and David, you could uh, support this or, or just tell me I'm crazy. But one of the things that I recently f- discovered is that we have, a, we have a program here in New York called BOCES, Board of Cooperative um, Extension, and everybody gets together, uh, four or five schools, and, and there's this one Votech Center that's all shared by it, and they, the kids get bussed over to that BOCES. And that's where the CTE programs exist. What I was told is that for every student that goes over there, the principal loses X amount of money every year toward his own budget because he's got to pay for that. And there's school systems with two or 3,000 kids, and they're only sending 17 to CTE. And someone said, well, what's going on? They said, follow the money path. <laughs> so they, they actually put a top limit on it. And have you ever heard that, Dave? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we deal with, uh, in fact, I worked at a BOCES center before I came to the college. It was actually my first teaching job. Uh, I think the challenge there is they have a business model, right? Uh, in order for them to survive, there has to be a cost to send students there. Uh, what we've seen on Long Island, uh, Long Island is a unique place because you have to take a bridge or a plane or a boat to get here. Uh, and we sort of have a captive audience, but we, we also have 200 plus districts in just Nassau and Suffolk County. Uh, so with all those different districts, a lot of the districts are now starting to create their own automotive programs, their own mechatronics programs, their own STEM programs. Uh, and they're, they're doing a lot of the vocational pieces that BOCES was offering and has been providing for years in house. Uh, so my, my challenge is that I go out and visit a lot of these uh, school districts and kind of help them to establish their programs. And what I found is that a lot of these programs are uh, putting new life back into automotive. Uh, so that's, that's one of the interesting things that you're seeing is that a, a shift away from the vocational uh, schools here in, in New York back to the individual districts. But yeah, and, and that's, and it's really, it, it really is a great piece because they can all of a sudden, um, you know, have a whole nother pipeline for technicians. I just went out recently to Long Beach High School uh, in Nassau County, which is uh, in a pretty prominent area in Nassau County down by the water and uh, beachfront properties in many instances. But there was 85 students in this automotive program that is just you would never even know it existed unless you went looking for it. And you probably uh, looked at them as potential recruits, right? Absolutely. Wow. Uh, You know, so establishing pipelines of students from high schools to community college to shops like Seth's that ultimately are going to take care of them is is the model we need to build and replicate. I'm so glad I asked you that question because you just opened my eyes to that. And I didn't know that was going down uh, there on Long Island. 200 and some districts. We talk about duplication of overhead. uh, You know, uh, it's just that's what drives me nuts. I just can't believe that they can't do some consolidation. Yeah, that's why our taxes are ridiculous here, but I didn't say that out loud. No, you didn't. No, you, uh, I didn't hear you. Your governor did not hear you. Hey, I want to thank Anthony Williams for hanging out with us. Uh, he's he's here on the um, on the Zoom platform. you got to go back to episode 418 and listen to me, Anthony, and Chris Chesney. We were, um, wow, you know, Anthony is in charge of this new, you know, charter automotive school, AIST, out in Colorado. And it is a vision of his, and they are working hard and funding and building and curriculums and 
totally uh, exciting program. So thank you for being here, Anthony. I, I appreciate you know your contributions to the show. Now, I, I've been kind of listening and, and doing some writing at the same time and trying to pull the essence of the uh, talking points here today. Let me give you my summary before I ask you all for a final comment. Tours, student tours of your shop. Speak to career days. Don't miss one. You, you know, if, if you're going to make any kind of phone call, make it to the school and says, hey, when's your career day? Be at middle school, be at high school. Bring the guidance counselors and the principals to tour your shop. Show career paths to parents. My thought was, on that was if, trust me, you have parents that are your customers. They have middle schoolers. Are you talking to them? Hey, you know, Bobby's with you. You know, does he show? What's he going to do? What do you got planned? What do you have plans, <laughs> parents, for your kid's career? Did you know? Bring him down to the shop one day. I'd love to show him this high-tech automotive world. And um, <clears throat> and have career paths inside your shop. The worst thing that you would possibly have is to bring someone in and says, you don't want you know, you to work in the automotive business. You know, and, and we hear that. All, sometimes all too often you, you get out of here kid as quick as you possibly can what are you crazy we don't we, we need to change that and i think part of the why, why and how we need to change that is is uh, is run better companies with improved cultures so let me go around the room aaron uh thanks for being here it was uh, great to have you share your perspective on cte i'll give you a, a final word thank you i appreciate you having me um uh, dave i i'm Appreciate you saying you went out to Long Beach here in two weeks. I'm getting ready to go visit as well to see those programs. So um, I hear they're a great program out there. So hope it goes really well. Um, but yeah, just like you said, it, as much as our local companies and community colleges can get into our school districts to help the students and help the teachers and to you know find that pathway, that desire to show them that it's not you know dirty and not so safe there because a lot of parents think that the shop's not safe. And so we, we teach them a lot too with safety and we teach them a lot of all the new high tech equipment. Um, and then bringing those cars in too, like you said, some Lamborghinis earlier and the students love seeing that. And that's you know, my son, you know, that's, if, that's what brightens his eyes up when he's going to all these different programs with me is seeing those cool cars and that's what he wants to work on now. And so that's, if you can bring those things in, give them the things they can touch and let them play with it. I think that's going to really help increase our enrollment overall. Yeah, you know, he just brought up a great point, Seth. I mean, you had a Lamborghini in there because you were working on it, right? We were working on it. I, I do have some we bring up to the schools. I mean, we okay. I brought them to the high school. I brought them to the college. I mean, you know, I we 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 get some of those cool cars in the students' hands. Cool. To, All right. Look, well, that's, that's that's ingenious. So you better go out and find some friends <laughs> that have Lamborghinis who will let you drive it for a day. <laughs> Seth, I'll give you the last word. Or no, I'll give you your final word. I'm sorry. No, I mean, it's it's a great panel. I mean, it, they're doing some good things with the schools and happy to see more people getting involved from the colleges and on your show. Hey, thanks so much for your all your support, and uh, we got a really hot topic coming up in a few weeks. Thank you for that, Dave. You actually have the last word now. All right. Well, thank you for having me again. It's been a pleasure to be here and uh, on this esteemed panel and uh, on your show. Um, we have a lot of work to do, and it's it's a daily, you know, it's a daily grind. But at the same time, you know, the more of cess uh, we have out there, and the more folks like you spreading the word, and uh, you know, folks like us in the community colleges and the high schools, uh, the more we can collectively work together towards this same goal continue to tell this story uh you know we'll make a difference thanks and, and do me a favor everyone who's listening don't let this go in one ear and out the other find a way to to really make a change in in how you uh speak to and for our industry uh, make the phone call you know you said ah you, the dave should reach out yeah maybe dave should reach out maybe aaron should reach out but really uh it benefits you the most service professional owner uh it's not hard, you know, you, you, lunch break, drive to the school, walk in and say, hey, who's the uh, who's the department chair? Who's the principal? And even if they can't see you at that moment, get the get the business card, do something about it. If we start a grassroots effort because it, we're going to fix our problems, the pendulum is going to swing. And, and we just got to have the right messaging. We got to fix it. We got to fix any problems that we have inside, too. Hey, thank you so much, um, Seth Thorson in Atlanta out there for training. Thank you so much for catching an early flight so you could be on here today from Eurotech in Brighton, Minnesota. 
And Seth created a $25,000 endowment for automotive careers in, in his old good old hometown. We talked about that in episode 340. Dave Mockholds, academic chair of Suffolk Community College, State University of New York, Automotive Technology. Thanks so much. And Aaron Dalton, North Kansas City Schools, the coordinator of school to career programming. Thank you guys for being here. Have a great weekend. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time. Oh,